Making it to your exodus. Yeah. Mm. See, a lot of you take life, I think, a little bit for granted. I think we all tend to at one point or another. When she came through the matrix, she came out fighting. She being the young lady that just sang. When she came through the matrix, there were no guarantees. Some of us came out ready to cut up, had all our strength, stayed in the hospital a day and went home. She came out, she didn't even know who she was, what she was, she just was. She came out fighting for her life and I don't even believe she understood I'm quite sure she didn't, that her life was teetering. And then she got past that part of her life and had to endure rejection from so many. That locks you into a, that can lock you into a place of, I'm not worth anything. You know, I, I don't know exactly how she dealt with it as a child, but I do know that grandma and grandpa was there. Hallelujah. And then she found herself locked into another situation. And then another situation, none of which was her own doing. I don't know if she can fully appreciate it or verbalize it, this is a no excuse thing. But over time she, she grew up and she started making decisions that weren't really right for her. And at that time God had situated something to where she could hit a wall. And when she hit that wall, grandma and grandpa was there again. And when they were trying to say, we're going to throw her with the rest of the vagabonds and the do-nothings and the want to not have anything, grandma and grandpa said, not so, not this child. She'd been, she been rejected and locked up too long. Not in a jail, not in a juvenile, but in rejection. You know, rejection can lock you up. It can put you in bondage. Mm. Huh? And, and, and for the life of me, watching other siblings come through the same matrix and be adored while you're rejected can hurt. And she weathered that storm. I don't know how, but she did. You know, some, some kids don't understand it, and I don't think they'll ever have to go through it because they had mom and daddy, and mom and daddy had them, and and everything was good. They had a constant place to live. They had constant needs met. They, they were being taught, they were being nurtured, but she was like a flag in the wind. She was being blown, stuck on a pole. You ever see a flag just stuck on a pole? It goes where the wind takes it, but it never moves anywhere else but where the wind is mounted. And then God moved and said, you know what, I'm going to send you back to your grandma and your grandpa. And he did. Grandma and Grandpa weren't quite ready for it. We weren't quite ready for it. We, I was making plans, vacation plans, and doing some other stuff. And God said, no, not yet. You know, Moses had plans. And he thought he knew how the plans were going to look. And God said, no, not yet. So then he took matters in his own hand and had to leave Egypt. And he was gone for 40 years. And during that time, he established another life. He was in vacation land, working and making money and chilling with his wife and dealing with the goats and 
taking care of his father-in-law's business, and he probably thought, oh, well, this is it. And God said, no, not yet. There's a fire over there you need to check out. So God sent us a 13-year-old that we weren't quite ready. We was okay. We were used to the weekend visits. She could, she could chill and rest on the weekend. We sent her back home. But this time, she wasn't going nowhere. She was at home. She made an exodus to grandma and grandpa's house. Sometimes I, I, I can imagine that she feels like we just, they're just old people. They, they don't get me. And sometimes she's probably right. It's been a long time since we had a teenager in the house. And she, she reminded me how weird they are. <laughs> Strange creatures, teenagers. Amen. Ooh, they'll make you get a headache from crossing your eyes at them. But they can give you so much joy. Amen. So much hope. Yep. So much peace in their oddities. And they're fumbling through life trying to figure it out. And in their such, such assurance that they have figured it out. I got it. I'm 16. I know. I know. She came to me one day. She said, man, man. I said, yeah. She said, I want you to do something. I said, what's that? She said, I want you to teach me how to take care of the house. I want you to teach me how to pay bills and how to run a house. I said, Okay. Now, one thing I'll confess, and, and that is I'm a terrible trainer. I'm the worst trainer of an employee of anybody. I, I'm the first to tell you, don't send your employees for me to train them because they'll come to you complaining. And so she said that, and that's to me, the best thing for her to do is watch, ask questions. Don't expect me to come to you with, with things. Just watch and ask questions. In other words, peer a little bit, lean forward into what you see me doing, and quietly absorb it all. See, the best teacher I've learned is experiential. Experiential is what you see with your eyes, what you hear with your ears, what you touch with your hands, what you smell with your nose, and what you taste with your mouth. Those are really good teachers. And, and, and because she's entered her exodus, as she proclaimed in the song, she is now learning the art of consideration, respect, and stability, and responsibility for one's own decisions. And sometimes she don't get main man. She don't understand. She's like, well, he just won't listen. And, well, I mean, my mom taught me, and she, she's a lot older than her. And life has taught me, and I've been around a lot longer than her. So I'm trying to learn her by talking to her. You ever ask your teenager, what would you learn in school, and they didn't know how to answer you? Mm -hmm. That is strange to me. <laughs> what would you learn today? And then they tell you what class they went to, but they ain't telling you what they learned today. I look at her sometimes, and I think she wonder if I understand English. I do. I just have a problem with Tinglish. Tinglish will mess you up. You try to listen to these teenagers, boy, they may, don't, 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 don't do it to yourself, parents. I'm going to preach. I know y'all. But I just wanted to say that, that thing about hurting yourself and needing deliverance, every teenager ought to sing that song because they hurt themselves. Every backslidden saint ought to sing that song and look for their exodus where God brings them out of that junk. Because just because you think you know what's best for you don't mean you know what's best for you. You can hurt yourself. And you can end up hurting people you say you love without realizing the amount of damage you've done until you see the results of the damage that you caused. Uh-huh. You wonder why he act like he does. Well, there's this thing called a mirror. You need, to, you need to check yourself out. I'm going to preach here in just a second. So, so 
when we begin to look at where we were and what God brought us out of, we'll begin to understand more clearly his admonition towards us that we are to watch. Now, for the past two Sundays, I've been talking about watching and being watchful. Can I get an amen? amen? There were two V's. One was vigilance and the other one was victorious. Y'all got that? Y'all remember that, right? It's only a couple of Sundays ago. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to talk to you a little bit more because I want these young people to know what to look for. Amen. They need to have a forward-looking mentality. And I'm going to tell you, whatever they sow, they're going to reap. Yeah. They, you're going to reap it. You may think right now you ain't going to be like, like your parents are to you when you have children because your children ain't going to be like you, uh, like, like that, and your parents are going to, you're going to be a smarter parent than your parent. You mess around here and soft parents your way to, to the jailhouse to get them. Uh-huh, be talking about I'm looking for my child on the streets. Okay, I'm going to preach. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this day and for your deliverance. We thank you for your wisdom and for your presence in this place. Use me, O King, to thy delight and thy glory. Anoint every hearer that they might hear what the Spirit would say unto them and every heart that they might receive the same. Let your will be done in me this day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I will title this message, What Do We Look For? To Know the Difference Between the Profane and the Holy. So let's just title it, What Do We Look For? Now, when you're watching, and the two messages that you got were about vigilance, and about victory. Now, you got to know when you've already won. You know how people say, you know, uh, leave well enough alone. You know, some people don't know when enough's enough. You know how, how kids like Josiah, he's sort of like his grandpa. He loves sweets. And Josiah, by his very nature, really don't know when he's had enough sweets and junk food because he loves it so much. But his stomach tends to let him know. Now, Josiah is a very bright, smart little boy. He's very astute. Don't let his age fool you. But the boy is like his grandpa. He loves good. He probably got something sweet and chunky in his mouth now. Yeah, he does. And it, it's a, he, you know, my grandson's a trip. One day he came up to me. That boy said, Grandpa. Can I have some, can I, I think, bro, you look like a heroin addict in need of a fix. I mean, he was literally rubbing his own, he, he, he wanted some, some ice cream or something. So let me go and preach to you because I want you to know what, what to look for, just like Jesus wanted us to know what we look for, what, what to look for. He told us, he said, observe the seasons. You know, you could tell when fall is, getting here because there's no longer uh, 97 can degrees and 102 degrees, especially here in Texas. The temperature drops to the low 80s and mid 70s and, and sometimes we even get it to where it, it drops to the 60s and that's Texas. Mm -hmm. Go with me to Matthew chapter 24. Chapter 24 of Matthew. Because, you know, we look at what's going on in Israel and in the Middle East, and we look at what's going on in the Caucasus, better known as, uh, as uh, Ukraine, and what's going on in Russia, and what's going on in, in, in there are places we haven't heard about, but there's wars and rumors of wars, okay? And, and there's great persecution of the saints right now. There's been going on for years in Sudan, but it doesn't make news, Max. Fox, CBS, ABC, because it's not in Europe and it's not in the Middle East. It's on the great continent of Africa. And so we every now and then might hear about Somalia when in Minnesota they have to arrest some Somalians for cutting up. But we don't hear about on a regular what's going on in Somalia and amidst all this destruction. 
Verse 36 reads, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, into the ark. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, and the one shall be taken and the other left. You may be seated. Amen. So there is something about why Christ said this, and it follows up on verse 42. And he's telling you that because he's giving you a cause to watch. Now, you need to know what to look for. He gives you indicators. Uh, as it was in the days of Noah, in another place, he, he, he talks about Sodom and Gomorrah. He, he at other times mentions Shiloh. He, in the Old Testament, he says, remember what I did at Shiloh. And, and I would encourage you to remember what he did at the Tower of Babel, what he did at Jericho, what he did in the midst of the Red Sea what he did when you were messed up from the flow up. So what do we look at and how do we know the difference between Jesus getting ready to come and your being ready for him to come? See, everybody wants to know, is he getting ready to come? Is this it? Is this Armageddon? Is this it? You know, we, well, the church don't need to worry about it because we're not going to be here when the great tribulation comes. I hope I hope that they're right, but I'm not sure they are. Because if he would let Paul get his head cut off and Peter be crucified upside down and Stephen gets, why should he take me out of the mess? Mm -hmm. And so they equivalent that with Noah being the eighth person saved on the ark. And see, he took them out. But what about the others that were righteous? Noah wasn't the only one that was righteous. Because the rain wouldn't have started without Methuselah dying. So was Methuselah an ungodly man? But who knows? So I have a little trouble with that precept, and I'm really not worried about whether it's a pre-tribulation, post-tribulation, all that other stuff. I know I have to be ready. Come yes. On, come on. I know that I have to be ready, and he has given us an invitation to death. You know, there's an appointment book. Huh, that, that says that one day your name is going to go into that appointment book and it cannot be canceled or nullified except Jesus returns before that day. Now, now we know that he is speaking to an audience that's wondering pretty much like most of us are and we look at the events of the day. We rem I remember when the towers fell. I remember when they first tried to blow up the towers in the, in the parking garage of the Twin Towers. So most of you weren't even born when that happened. I remember that. I remember when they bombed the barracks in, in uh, was it Lebanon? What was that? They bombed the, uh, the embassy and killed all those Marines. Uh, I remember that. That was in Lebanon, wasn't it? Uh-huh, because Ronald Reagan, I remember the Falklands War. Everybody said, oh, I remember Yom Kippur, the war. Oh, it's Armageddon. God ain't going to let them do that to, to Israel. Wait a minute. You talk about the same God that let millions die in the gas chamber? So what do you look for? Let me, let, me, let me break this down as simply as I can. The first thing you need to worry about is you. The first, okay, the first thing you need to look for is your spiritual condition. The first thing you chiefly need to look for is looking inwardly. We need to do daily inventories of ourselves. Now, to see, Paul says to see whether or not you be in the faith. Mm -hmm. You need to check you first. 
Don't worry about all the, all the other news and all the other star readers and all the other palm readers and all the other naysayers and, and all the other horoscope readers and all the other forecasters of imminent domain, I mean, imminent destruction and the return of Jesus. If any man come to you telling you, I've calculated it, Jesus is going to come November 22nd, 2034 at 6 p.m. He's going to show up in Madison Square Garden. Run. Run away from that person. Get in the corner and pray for them. Lord, deliver them. Because they are so messed up. Because nobody can tell you when. If I ask all the young people from the age of 21 on down to stand up, I want all y'all to stand up from 21 on down. At least until the age of 10 or 11. If you're not 10, you can sit down. Okay, which one of you could tell me when you're going to die? Okay, make it easy. How are you going to die? Will you have children? Will you get married? One is already married. She's real young. Got, she, she's ready to have another baby. Go on, girl. You can sit down. Question still applies. If you can't answer that, you can't answer that question. How long do you have to live? And if so, will you be healthy in your living? Will you be bedridden? Will somebody have to spoon feed you? And if you don't think God can put you on your back, stay, sit, sit down. If you don't think God can kill you, sit down. If you don't think God, nothing can happen to you, sit down. Okay, good. Now you can sit down. Well, then don't live like it. Live towards God like you know you will not be here tomorrow. You don't know when you're going to go. That's right. Lady was out looking for her son, got hit by a car. She had to go to the hospital. Huh? She said she's glad to be alive. Her car spun around three times. It could have easily been her last time. Now, here's the question I want to ask. Will that young man be able to say, well, it ain't my fault if she had died? Because she was looking for him. She was looking for him. What if she become a paralytic because she was looking for you? It's not funny. What if she driven up and see a bunch of lights flashing and a yellow tarp over somebody? And the only thing she could see was your big feet. That happens. I got a phone call one morning a couple of years ago, a few years ago. And it was raining that night. It rained hard. And when I answered the phone, I saw it was my secretary. And she was crying. Harder than the rain was falling. And she said, my son is dead. They killed my son. They killed my son. I think he had just turned 16. Tall, good looking young man. Unruly. Didn't want to listen. Knew everything. Thought he'd hang, hang loose with some gangbang to sell a little dope. They shot him in his mother's house. She held him when he stopped breathing. So don't think you so cute and so fine that God can't end your life. Come on. Come on, preacher. So what do we look for? What do I mean when I say check yourself? Are you obedient to your parents? Do you give them regard? Do you give them consideration for the little things they do for you? Are you giving them honor and respect by saying, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am? Or is it, uh-huh, what, yeah, right. And then you roll your eyes. What if your parent woke up to take you to school or to a doctor and on the way they had a heart attack and died and you just had a little nasty attitude about them mm. because they said no to you. Mm. 
about something, and you and you there in the car with your, your mom or your dad, and you don't know what to do. What do you do with that memory? What do you do with what pocket? It's not funny. What do you do with that pocket? You put it in your pocketbook, your drawer. What do you do with that memory? Huh? I know what it's like to look at my mom when she was dead. Don't we know what it's like? I know what it's like to see my daddy in a casket. I know what it's like to watch a boy in the fifth grade. No, he was in the, yeah, he was in the fourth grade. Go to the grade. He was in the fourth or third grade, and I remember him going, being a pallbearer at his funeral. So what do we look for? We don't look for just moments alone on a global scale. We look inwardly first, because you've got to make sure of your salvation. You've got to make sure that your conversation is holy. You can't mix your profanity with holiness and think God is going to look away. You're either holy or you're not. If you, if you have been given a set of standards that you are to exhibit, you're supposed to go to school, do your work, you're supposed to go to job, do your work, you're supposed to carry yourself like you got some sense, like you're respectable, but you're not doing it and you don't care. Because yeah. it's a lot of that, I don't care. Yeah. I don't care what Bishop White said. He don't know me. Yeah. huh? I, he don't know what I'm like. huh? He ain't with me, me and my boys. Well, you such a leader, why aren't your boys here in church with you? If you such a leader and they honor you so much, why don't they, you ought to have a whole crew behind you? Huh? But you don't want them to come because then they're going to see how big of a hypocrite you really are. Uh, you don't bring them to your mama's and daddy's house. If you know, notice these young people, don't, if they go to church, they don't like to bring schoolmates over to their house. Every great now and then, they'll bring somebody from their school and they'll call them friend in a minute. Mm -hmm. yep. But they will not bring them home because they know that if they bring them home, they're going to see that your mom and dad really aren't devilishly stupid. Right. Like you say they are. Come on, you Amen. Uh -huh. See, at my house, you don't come to my house, man. You don't come over there because my parents, you know, they, they ain't with it, man. They, they, they like this, this, that, 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 that. You know, they ain't with it. No, they just know you ain't with it. Come on, though. And I'm going to tell you something. Your children are observing you. Observe yourself. If you're not praying and they don't see you pray and you come to church and now you want to pray, mm. they're going to check off that box and say hypocrite. Yep. They don't see you reading your Bible until you go to church. They're going to check that box off. Hypocrite. Yep. <laughs> they hear you talking down about somebody in the other room That's or right. about each other and you don't think they hear you and they check that box. Hypocrite. Oh, I don't want to be like them. And because they're observing themselves and they're marrying it to your vision that you're giving them and they're seeing this thing in real time, they're saying, this must not be real. Because if they're hearing what I'm hearing then, and they expect me to do right, what aren't they doing right? Spend a little time with your kids. I ain't scared to tell a child to shut up. Because sometimes they don't know how. Some, some kids, they, they try to overspeak you. My granddaughter ain't no different. Sometimes you just got to give them that, show them your teeth, tell them to shut up. <laughs> Amen, because they want to they wanna get it out. Yep, yep. But my job is to teach you how to run a house. Sometimes the best way to run your house is to know how to shut your mouth. That's it. That's it. <laughs> See how I went back to that? See, I know how to, I, I know how to run a house and a business. God taught me. So what the first thing we do is we must see if our spirit is on par with the will of God. If your spirit is okay on Sunday, on Wednesday night, at, at brotherhood meetings, at sisterhood meetings, huh, your spirit's okay as long as you're working in the corner by yourself 
and you don't have to answer or worry about nobody else. The minute somebody asks you something, you dumb down. The minute somebody, God gives you an opportunity, your spirit is good as long as you by yourself. But the minute God allows a challenge to come against you, all bets are off. Your spirit needs to be willing to get whipped and stoned for the gospel's sake. See, you got to look for the first things first. The first thing is your conduct. You get mad and want to cuss, call your children stupid. You see, you're just stupid. Can't tell you nothing. You need to get saved. You need to repent because you just backslid. That's right. Yeah, you don't do that. You don't. You don't, you don't call your children stupid and ignorant. You just, uh, well, you raising them. What kind of parent are you? Come on, come on. Come on. You pouring that into them. And then you expect them to respect you? Uh, if you're going to get on them, get on them right. Say, you know you weren't supposed to do that, right? You know that, right? The rules of this house is like God's rules. He chastises me when I mess up. And I'm going to chastise you when you mess up. And the reason why I'm going to do it is because I love you like God loves me. Now, I don't want God to hit me with a belt. God uses circumstances to get me. Huh, but my job is to obey you according to God's word. So I'm not going to spare the rod because I don't want you spoiled. So I'm, I'm going to whoop you and you're going to scream. If you whoop a child and they look like they're glad to get a whooping from you, then you need to get, get saved. You ain't, you ain't saved right. Uh -huh. When you hit a child and that child look at you like, oh, what was that? You need to go Merle White on them. My mother was whooping me and my brother one day. I forget what the infractions were. And for some reason, she decided to go television whooping on them. She said, bend over. My mother usually didn't say bend over. She just grabbed something and beat you with it. Mm -hmm. But I guess she was trying to tone it down this particular day. And so me and Leroy, we bent over. And my mother walked up behind Leroy. She got him first. He the younger. He, he had a bunch of cushion. He was a fat little boy. <laughs> I was skinny. And she walked up behind Leroy, and she hit him three or four times, four or five times. And he, on that first one, boy, he let loose like like he was being filled with the Holy Ghost. And bro, he, I think he, he might have sounded like he was speaking in tongues. <laughs> I, I remember knowing I wasn't worthy of the whooping. I didn't do anything, but I was in the vicinity. I was guilt by association. I remember that. So I bent over and she hit me. Why y'all? Why y'all? See, that belt, if your belt don't go, why y'all? You ain't hitting them right. <laughs> Your belt ought to make sound. Yeah, it got a whoosh, has a whistle to it. Yeah, yeah. Or a zip. Like, like Brother Compion was preaching, he said he heard that bullet go by him. Uh, they need to thank you shooting at him. <laughs> <laughs> so she hit me that third time, hi y'all. That fourth time, hi y'all. That fifth time, hi y'all. I counted, and I said, you through? <laughs> Y'all got it, right? I said, are you through? And she said, oh, you not going to cry? <laughs> Forget the bend over. <laughs> she started beating me like I was bought right off the ship. <laughs> she, she started laying into me like she paid for me. Huh? She beat me. And do you think I cried? Oh, yes. With joy in my heart, I cried. <laughs> Just let her stop hitting me. But see, what we have to do as adults, if we're going to watch, we need to know what to look for. The first thing you do is look for yourself, your conduct. Are you practicing the use of time with wisdom? Are you a good steward over the things God gave you? Are you encouraging your children to know the country they live in, to know the laws of the country they live in, to know how to wash their bodies right, to know how to the importance of taking care of their hygiene. Are you teaching them how to keep their hair clean, how to keep their mouths clean, how to talk to people, how to respect and be considerate one towards another? I think it, I don't see a problem with Zariah saying yes, ma'am, to Imani. Imani's a young woman. Zariah's a child. 
she's a toddler. I don't see a problem with Jeremiah saying yes ma'am or no ma'am to, to Kayla or to, to uh, Sunday. She's a, he's a little boy. They're adults. They're young adults. Okay, Kayla's six, 17. She's 17 already. already. Oh, God bless you, brother. <laughs> you got it locked and loaded? Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> yeah, locked and loaded, yeah. <laughs> Waiting for broom to show up. <laughs> he, he might show up with braces in his mouth, too. <laughs> uh-huh. Real thick Coke bottle glasses. Oh, wow. Can't wear contacts because he... <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. The second thing we need to look for, after we've examined ourselves, are we faithful over the things we receive from God, whether it be a gift of the Spirit, a talent, or whether it be riches, finances, opportunity, are we faithful? Do we, are we mindful to be stewards over the gift of life? And that's what you teach your children. Don't run with hoodlums. Who them shoot at and get shot at? I don't want you running with them. Because what will what happen is you'll start making up stuff about yourself. You'll try to put on airs like you were a gangbanger or you was a red or, yeah, I shot at somebody or, yeah, I was shot at. You, the most you've been shot at was when a bird dropped something on your shoulder. <laughs> That's it. But you want to come across bad and then you'll find they're going to ask you to put your mouth Put your body where your mouth is. Oh, oh you that tough? Here you go. Go hit old man's store over here and make sure you bring me the money. Uh, your little hand be like this. Sweating. Talking about I got COVID. I can't go today. I got long and short COVID. I can't go today. Yeah. Well, we're going to have a gangbang over here. See, I, back in my day, one side of the, the, the blocks, this side over there would come against us. I remember one night my brother came home. He ran in the house. He said, come on, Terry, let's go. Lonnie, you can't go. And my brother's only 13 months older than me. I said, where are we going? He said, we're going to meet up. It's a fight. He said, we're going to Lockwood Park right over here on the east side in Dignity. I said, all right, let's go. And we met up with the Liels and the uh, Garzas and... Seemed like it was the Martinez's too, because we had a whole bunch of Latino vatos on our side. See, I grew up eating hot stuff before y'all was born. I grew up watching them make tamales before you, amen. amen. Mr. Martinez was one of them old school Mexicans that crossed the border on foot. That's the kind of guy that wore khakis every day and a sweaty hat. Worked in the backyard. Hands thick, man, big fingers, look like hot dogs. <laughs> you know, one of them guys. So anyway, we go and we're headed towards Lockwood Park. Now, <laughs> I said, what's going on? He said, yeah, the Lamar Street and Hayes Street and Burnett, they're coming up against us. Okay, no problem. So we're going up to Lockwood. And one of the Leals asked my brother, said, how come Terry don't have a weapon? Because they had blades, chains. Little, little, little baseball bats with nails in them and, and, and all that. And uh, my brother, I think he had a little 22 or something. And they said, how come, how come, how come Terry ain't got nothing? My, bro my brother looked at them and said, he don't need nothing to fight with. He is a weapon. <laughs> uh-huh, yeah. And, and, and they said, what? So I did it, you know, I was loosening up, throwing flying kicks on the way, punching, doing spinning heels on the way. We got to Lockwood, and it's getting dark, and we could see them coming. And man, the adrenaline was pumping. I was ready to hurt somebody's kid. And they were ready to hurt somebody's kid. And right when we met up, no closer than where Bobby is, we were getting ready to charge, and we hear whoop, 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 why? I don't know where these police came from. We couldn't run. They was all around us. Yeah. We didn't even see them because our focus was wrong. We were looking for the wrong thing. Wow. Now, you go through life thinking God don't see you mm. until it's too late. Whoop, whoop. Mm. Oh. 
You think you you good. You think you really good. You ready. You well armed. Yep. And you are found lacking because you are out of order. You're abusing the gift of life. Wow. Somebody's child could have died that day. It could have been me. So don't go around thinking you, you're invincible. Nothing can happen to you. Nothing can happen. You need to be a good steward. What do good stewards do? They pray. They meditate on God's word. They go to work, and when they go to work, they do it like they're doing it for Jesus. Amen. When they go to school, they go to school with conduct that says, I'm a nerd for Jesus. I'm not going to cuss. I'm not going to run with this nappy head Dreadlock wearing, no teeth brushing, musty underarm, pants sagging, sorry. I'm not going to run with them. I don't need to prove anything to any of them. Come on. That's right. Come on. To none of them. But young people in the church nowadays, they're scared to be too religious. They don't want, because then they, they won't fit in. Why you got to fit in? Because you're you going to get a seed number you keep on. Yeah, you're going to get, yeah, some of y'all been in touch with the law. Mm-hmm. Get a seed number, hear them doors go, shh, chang, chang. Yep. Right. Be talking about, oh, I can handle this until Big Bubba walk up on you. Right. What's your name? <laughs> yeah, poke your little chest out. Yep. Big Bubba got one of them hands, look like hot dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Before you get that tough, say, let me see your hand, sir. <laughs> and then you look at your hand and say, whatever. <laughs> hey, can I pray? I'm a praying man. <laughs> see, I, I believe that's why a lot of people get Jesus up in there. Come on, preacher. Come on, preacher. Oh, they get Jesus, Paul, Peter, Zechariah, Zephaniah, Amos, and Noah. <laughs> Come on, preacher. The third thing you have to understand is you have to have a really good memory to know what to look for. You have to look for the idea that you cannot forget the everlasting covenant God has made with you. The only way that covenant will now become invalid is if you tear it up. If you disregard it and if you don't keep covenant. Honor thy mother and father. Pay attention to be a good citizen. In spite of your surroundings. Take care of what God give you. Don't be be your body first. You don't be inhaling and and talk about what all I was doing was vaping. They will put, uh, 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 what is it called? Fentanyl. Fentanyl in your vape pen. Oh, yeah. Oh, y'all don't believe it. And even if not, they might say, oh, have you tried Jägermeister? They can put it in your Jägermeister. Uh Uh-huh. Have you tried uh, a Foster's beer? Have you tried Slit Smart Liquor Bull? Have you tried Cutty Salk? Have you tried Johnny Walker Red? Have you tried ke- Kettle, whatever they're all? That, yeah. They're, I, I, hey, they go down to the Kavase. Oh, hmm. She probably go to y'all school. <laughs> you know, somebody named their child Kavase. What's your name? My name Kavase. <laughs> Ask her, say, Kavase, how, how many pounds does your hair weigh? <laughs> oh, wow. Oh boy. She'll reach down and grab the end of it. <laughs> oh, oh. I think it will. Bishop. Bishop. <laughs> I'm trying to. Bishop. Keep covenant. If you can't keep your word with your church and the people and the commitment you made at church, how can you keep your covenant with God? You say you're going to be somewhere. If you don't know how to, Josh, didn't I buy you a watch? Do you wear that watch? Yeah. What time is it? So you're wearing a different watch, but you're wearing a watch. Does it help you know how to answer that question, what time it is? Uh Uh-huh. Imani, didn't I buy you a watch? What time is it, baby? You ain't even wearing another watch, are you? Uh Uh-huh. Elijah, what time is it? Yeah, right? I do. It's time to get a watch. It's time to pay attention. It's time to know where you stand within your covenant agreement with God. Don't you know you have to be on time? Sunday, you get rolled up for being late yet? 
You haven't been, how many times you've been late? About seven, eight times? 10, 12? 30, 40? <laughs> Two? More than that? You, 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 you probably late one time. You ain't never been rolled up, but so, so she, she's pretty timely. See, she's learned things by watching her mom and by watching her dad and by learning from the people she see in this church. Am I right? Amen. That's right. You know, when she was in high school, she wasn't pregnant. Now, I'm not knocking that because, you know, everybody make a mistake, yeah. especially when they're not taught. Yeah. That, that, that's okay. My, you know, that happens. But I'm using her because she was brought up in this church. And the effects of it was she stands out. See, there's a difference, isn't there? So you keep covenant. And when you make covenant with your eyes, you don't, men, you don't be talking to her, I can't believe she out there in her underwear. She's got on kangaroo underwear, pink kangaroo underwear. Look how they cut all up. And why are you still looking? Right, right. Preach, preach. After a while, you're going to be able to tell who made them, what country, Thailand, Pakistan, or China. Make a covenant with your eyes. Make a covenant with your hands. Make yes, a covenant with your attitude. Yes, I am not going to disrespect my mom and dad outside of this house. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to sully their name. Mm -hmm. You want somebody to say, oh, you're, you're, you're hey with Adams and son? Man, I could figure that out because you, man, you so upright. You, you, you got it going on. Or he's going to say, oh, you, yeah, I know your daddy. You just like it. Oh, man. That, that, you don't want that kind of thing. I'm not knocking anybody, so don't be talking about, ooh. Because yeah. some of y'all like that. Yeah. yeah, if it had not been for Jesus, Jesus. where would you be? Jesus. Thank you you got to know what to look for. You got to know what to look for to be different. There's a, you got to know the difference between the holy and the profane within your own framework first. Mm -hmm. Then you got to know how to carry yourself. And then you got to know the season that you're in. Mm -hmm. Brother, Brother Compion was talking. He said, man, I couldn't keep a job. I'll take it a step further. That brother couldn't keep a job if you taped it to his head. <laughs> that brother could not keep a job. And when he finally kept a job, God oh, blessed him with a house. Huh? Because he began to enter into another season of maturation. Come on. Children, little kids, do what little kids do. Right. When you're a toddler, you, we, we expect you to be like a toddler. Mm -hmm. When you're a teenager, you're going to do stuff that make parents go, what? Because <laughs> y'all do that. I was a teenager. I was a nerdy teenager. I was a, a go-to-church teenager. Amen? And, and we were involved in our church like you young people are going to get involved in this church. We got some plans for y'all. We're going to send y'all to some, so y'all going, y'all going, we're going to see if you can pray. Yeah. We're going to see if you really want to help other people. We're going to see if you really want to give people Jesus, young people Jesus in these cancer wards, in these hospitals that you're going to go to. Amen? We're going to see how much you really love God. Amen. Amen. So you, you got to note the season that you're in. Are you in a season of growth? Or are you in a season of being stagnant? What's going on around you? How is that affecting you and your spirit? Is God moving in this season without me? Or is he moving in the season with me because I'm paying attention? I'm watching. I'm not asleep. I'm, I'm, I'm an insomniac for the word of God, for the move of God. I am looking and I'm beholding the majesty of God in all these things. Everything that's going on right now in the world in Israel, Russia, Ukraine, Washington, D.C., New York City, San Francisco, God is allowing. God is allowing because people have turned away from serving him and trusting him. But, hey, go ahead and argue about whether there's more than two genders. Do it to your own demise. I don't have that kind of time. Because we all know a woman is a woman, man, a, a man is a man, and Biden is Biden. 
Okay. Yeah. Okay, whatever that is. Okay. The fifth thing I want you to understand is you must measure the pressure. Weigh the moments in that season. You have to measure the pressure. You have to weigh the moments in that season. You have to judge whether or not Noah is getting ready to go in the ark or if Sodom is getting ready to be blasted or, or is the sea going to open up? Huh? Or is, is he getting ready to unlock the sail of your life like he did Joseph and exalt you in due season? What is he getting ready to do? What is the pressure for? God does not allow you to be under pressure unless he's getting ready to do something in that season. Hallelujah. And you will miss it if you're not praying. Like you will miss it if you're not staying. You will miss it if you're not watching. And you won't know what to look for. I want to encourage you. The best way to know what to look for, here's your answer. Stay in your word. Yes, sir. Stay on your knees. And trust God. Amen. You stay, on, stay in your word. Stay on your knees and trust God. I'm going to say it again. Stay in your word. Stay on your knees and trust God. See, a man is supposed to go and take a wife. He ain't supposed to wait for the woman to decide whether or not he's worthy after she didn't gave him three or four kids. That's time to cut bait. Either it's time to cut bait because she ain't doing nothing but cause you to live a life of hypocrisy. Either you stay a hypocrite or you cut bait and leave or you get it right and don't leave her any room to squirm. She's just playing you straight to hell. And young ladies, don't let a man do you like that either. Don't let a man drag you. He will, but but I, I like it, church, but anytime you hear that, just ask him where his earrings are and, and if he's in love with his mom. Uh, and if, especially, you don't want a man that's wearing clam diggers. You don't want a man wearing clam diggers. And you don't want a man that think he's prettier than you. You don't, if you think he, good looking women ought to marry ugly men with good jobs and love God. Good looking women ought to marry ugly women with good jobs that love Jesus. Yeah, make sure, see if he got a couple of teeth missing. <laughs> Say, yeah, that, you know, got big old calluses on his hand. Make sure he ain't got no fingernail hardener on his hand, none of that shiny stuff. Huh? Huh? Look, look and check and see if he's wearing uh, dicky boot, uh, Timberlane boots still told and some dickies. Uh, if he's wearing guests, I guess you need to leave him alone. Uh huh. If, if he if he asks you if he arched his eyebrows right, leave him alone. If he always looking in the mirror while y'all getting gas, cause you pumping it. Hey hey, ba you you got it all in there, babe? Huh? Okay, you ready? Huh? Yeah, I'm ready. Drop him off. <laughs> Ask him to look at the tire outside, make sure the air is right. When he get out, close the door and take off. Uh-huh. Amen. Amen. I'm through. God bless you. Now you know what to look for. Trust God. Pray. Pray. Stay in your word. Love the brotherhood and be faithful to your church. God bless you.